Bond story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and directors. This week's On Story, a conversation with Jay Duplass, the talent behind the quirky films, the Puffy Chair, and the HBO series, Togetherness. We all watch movies, and we all watch so many movies that I think it's very easy to think that we can all make movies, you know? But the truth is, is like, it's an incredibly complex form and craft and art where you're synthesizing good story that is well told and is told in a visual way and where the, the people that you're telling the story to are like two years away. That's a weird thing. In this episode, Jay Duplass discusses the challenges of bringing DIY indie filmmaking to Hollywood. What are you doing? You have my Peter Gabriel CD. No, I mean, what are you doing? I'm picking you up for a road trip, dude. The name New Orleans, it was culturally bereft. Uh, <laughs> You know, just living in a little suburb, hanging out, making weird little art in our own way. We had a um, kind of a hippie godmother who came and helped us, like, cook Mardi Gras beads in the oven and makes weird stained glass. And then, uh, uh, and then in 1982, it was announced that cable was coming to our neighborhood. What is cable? Is it a giant cable laid out on the front lawn or something? We didn't know what it was. So when all of our friends were into... Empire Strikes Back. Um, we were watching hard-hitting relationship dramas <laughs> with nudity and divorce. Like Kramer versus Kramer, I've seen like 17 times between 1982 and 1984. We didn't really like the Star Wars movies that much. I mean, they were kind of cool, but that's not what Mark and I were talking about. You know, we were talking about the heavy hitting stuff. I mean, we were watching and, the, and we were watching a lot of Woody Allen. Well, you know, I came here in 1991 uh, and it was a magical time in, in film in Austin, um, Slacker, and everyone was talking about film. And I was like, what do you mean? You mean cable? <laughs> you mean that thing on the front lawn? And we, I started to wake up a little bit to the fact that film is an art. Movies didn't just get pumped in over a cable. Like, human beings made movies. Very specifically, Rick Linklater, I just, probably my sophomore year, I started taking a class, and I started taking more classes, and then I ended up... Um, almost getting another major in RTF and just I started writing and making films and you know we were cutting on we were making movies on 16 millimeter and cutting them with razor blades um super old school and you know uh, in in true form they were terrible early in film school I was trying to emulate the Coen brothers as was half of our film class mm -hmm. honestly Mark would like come visit me from high school and I was in at UT and I would make a movie and I'd put them in it and we just kept doing it and they were bad and every once in a while one of them wouldn't be so bad and we'd be like hmm, what well, wasn't so bad about that movie <laughs> um, and you know it really was more of just like a feeling around in the dark process but I think all those influences are they're always in you and you're trying you know we were always trying to make something that was like deep and funny you know, if you're a painter, no one really expects to, like, sell a painting for a decent amount of money until they've made, like, hundreds of paintings. But everyone has this weird subconscious thing in their mind that they're going to wake up one morning and just write something and then make it, and it's going to be the best thing ever. And I really feel like that just doesn't happen. So I, I, all this is just to say that I think it's an incredibly difficult thing to make something that doesn't suck. And it took me 10 years of making things. 
I hadn't made anything great. And I w looked back on my editing stuff too. And I was like, but I didn't really edit it. I'd edited like two things that I was proud of. And I was just pushing 30 and getting to that point where it's like, how much longer can I do this to myself and to my family? And, you know, my brother uh, said, okay, we're going to make a movie today. And I said, well, how are we going to do that? And he said, um, I don't care. We have mom and dad's v v video camera, a uh, little one chip mini DV. And he said, come up with something. And so my idea was, okay, this thing happened to me yesterday where I tried to like re-record the, the greeting of my answering machine. Yes, it was an answering machine at the time. Uh, <laughs> press the button, beep. Um, and I kept repeating it. And I couldn't get it right. And I kept it up and I had a nervous breakdown. Um, <laughs> hilarious right <laughs> and you know his eyes just widened so big when I told him that story which is now the basis of how we create stories we tell each other stories and when you don't have to ask if he likes it or not you see it and he was just like that's everything I had a one button down shirt and some pants with pleats that I had used when I worked for the Kelly people. And, uh, <laughs> and he went and got it and he, lo and he looked at the back of the shirt and it was called a John Ashford shirt and that became his character name and he walked in the door and I filmed a one minute, oh, a 20 minute one take of him doing this and he was in a similar place to me and he tried to get it right and got it wrong. Hi, you've reached John Ashford. Uh, this is 416-9754. I'm sorry I've missed your call, but if you could um, leave your... It's John Ashford. Hey, it's John. Sorry I missed your call. Leave me your number. I'll give you a call back later. Thanks. We submitted it to Sundance, and the head of the festival called me a month later and said, this is my favorite short that I've seen in a very, very, very long time. You know, the next movie we made was a tiny bit bigger. It cost 50 bucks and it was involved Mark and his girlfriend in a kitchen uh, that moved to a living room. We added one room uh, and they were playing Scrabble and they ended up having a huge fight. And that was the second short film that we got into Sundance. Sure. I guess I've just never heard that, but... Oh, really? I don't think it's a word. Is it? It's a noun, sure. Oh, it's a... It's one who makes shoes or puts shoes on people. I'm gonna go to Payless and talk to the shoer. Do you want to challenge me? Is that what you're saying? Well, we had made two short films that went to Sundance, and we were terrified of making a feature because we had made a couple of really cheap features here in Austin in our mid-20s that didn't work out. And um, we were just terrified uh, to f it up again. Um, but we knew that we were really good short filmmakers, not because we thought it, but because the whole world was telling us. So we, uh, we were like, okay, terrified of feature filmmaking. Um, but we we're good at shorts. Why don't we do this? Why don't we make a feature film that's basically like 13 five minute shorts in a row? And so that's that's what we did. And we used all the materials that we had available to us at the time. Uh, we had just moved to Brooklyn for dumb reasons, basically because all the filmmakers at Sundance were in Brooklyn. We're like, we have to move to Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, so we we just moved to Brooklyn. We had a Brooklyn apartment. Mark's girlfriend Katie had a was from a small town in Maine that was not only going to allow us to shoot there, but would like beg us to shoot there and like, can we come out and be extras in your movie for free? And we're like, yeah, that's great. And Mark had a van for touring with his band at the time. And those were the materials that we needed to make that movie, that and a DVX 100. I think it'll last about a week and Red will probably just go home. your problem? I, uh, what the frig is your problem? What is wrong with you? Well, I would like shoot Mark for like a few takes and feel like I got it and then I would turn around and maybe shoot Katie on the puffy chair for instance. But the whole thing is we're doing the scene from the very beginning to the very end. So if I need a bathroom portion and they're moving into the kit into the, the in the bedroom, 
I'll wait in the bathroom for the beginning. And once she leaves, I'll run out into the bedroom and see what I can catch of that. And it just kind of puts them in the mindset of like, this is something that is happening. And their job is not to give it to the camera. Their job is to like do something real. And the camera, and I think that there's something special about that in retrospect. I mean, bef at the time, it was just like, this is the fastest way we can shoot this, you know? Or this is the only way we can shoot this because we don't have crew. But at, now I realize that it, it's, a, it's a revolutionary to the studio system of filmmaking because essentially in a studio system, the actors are brought to the, to the apparatus of the, the filmmaking apparatus, which in a studio system is a massive, massive apparatus with like tons of trucks and a proscenium of like 50 to 60 to 100 people. And when you change that and you say, okay, the actors are first now, and the filmmaking apparatus, which in the case of the puffy chair is like me and a boom operator, is brought to the actors, there, there's a feeling that is completely different. And I think audiences feel that. I, th I think I know now uh, that there's, there's not a lot of people who do smart comedy well. I mean, there's like crazy balls out comedy like Dumb and Dumber 2. And then there's um, drama. Um, but there's a pocket of really smart comedies that... I don't know. There's not a lot of them out there, you know, and I think people want that and studio heads really want that. Um, so that they were very interested and in their mind, they were irrationally thinking if these guys look what they can do with $15,000, what if we gave them $15 million? The movie would literally be like a thousand times better. <laughs> yeah, we started, you know, writing scripts for different people and we, uh, have been surprisingly successful in getting famous people to come in a room and bear everything in an audition realm, which is rare. And then we don't really rehearse on set because uh, I would say 30% of what is in our movies is a first take that is such a big surprise that no one could have predicted it and everyone in the room is like, it's alive. That's, I know. It's like you asked for them without peppers? I did, but they never... I'm not gonna use this place anymore. That's like a I'm big sorry. red one right there. That's good. So, John, I have to apologize to you. What? I mean, you came in and I, I sat you down. I just started blabbing all about my life. I get overly excited sometimes, and I apologize. I honestly am curious to hear about you, and you know, just wanna wanna hear more about your life. Mark and I were just, you know, cavemen. We would come out of the cave and grunt and move lights and people around and just like, okay, go, the, you know, press the button, you know, and then they you know, required, we had a minimum, we got the crew down as small as we could to like 60 people, but it was unionized and, you know, we had to, we had to explain to everyone over and over and over again what we were doing and it was very painful to us because our, our process, is, you know, we use a lot of improvisation and it's all about discovery. Um, and trying to create an environment where like lightning can strike and then it doesn't really matter what that lightning looks like, we'll shape it up later. Um, and that, that is hard to do in the studio environment. Togetherness came about in a really stupid way. Uh, my brother is on this st TV show called The League and he goes away for three or four months every fall and I was like, I, I wanna do something in the fall. <laughs> so, <laughs> can't. <laughs> So, like, wrote this, like, pilot uh, that I was going to shoot with my friend Steve Zissis, who's in Baghead. He's my best friend. Um, that I was just going to have fun, maybe act in it, maybe just make a web series or something. And, and uh, once it was written, all of our friends were like, no, this is not a web series. Do yourself a favor. Pitch this to HBO. And we pitched it, and they loved it. And, um, and it, it was the type of story that just could go on forever and ever. It's about being 40 and having kids and trying to make your dreams come true and how both of those things is almost impossible. Um, and how it's like you're this close to drowning at every second. And I've been thinking about this a lot. I would say the main thing that's different about this kind of TV in particular, which is um, serial, long form storytelling, is that you are living in an open universe. <clears throat> you know, um, and I've had, I've, HBO's been amazing at kind of helping me get go through that it's weird because when I pitched it to HBO, they said yes, but I don't. They were they didn't want it to be about one character and three peripheral characters. They wanted it to be about four characters that were equal. And it I couldn't get my head around it because I'm a feature filmmaker and 
there's so many things about feature filmmaking that it is na natural to the form. So this is not a negative comment, but there's a lot of artifice that goes into feature film writing. In particular, like when you're writing your first 20 pages, everything that all the little nuggets you're setting up, you're literally already thinking about how you're going to pay those off in like 100 minutes, which usually causes weird hum humane and emotional compromises hence i'm not speak i'm gibberish but you know when you're in a movie and you're like yeah i can see where this is going they got to get together and you know the things have to happen so all the things have to go tv doesn't have that and that is incredibly powerful and i don't think it's just tvs in everybody's houses and home theaters that is making this kind of hbo storytelling so powerful it has something to do with the fact that it is an open universe and I think what I've been learning is that you have to do your plotty payoffs in every episode, but the big, big emotional that's going on with your characters just keeps expanding and growing. And there's something incredibly natural about it that is so freeing that I'm so excited about it, I can't even deal with it right now because that's one of the biggest things that Mark and I have had trouble with in our features is like finding that perfect sweet spot of how to give people that closure that they need, but to keep it real, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, like, like with Puffy Chair, we didn't really give people the, everyone wanted that couple to get together, even though they were fighting their ass off the whole movie. And when we showed it at Sundance, <clears throat> The premiere, we didn't think it was that big a deal because, you know, we were going through that at the time, being in your mid-20s and trying to figure out if you're going to get married or break up, and either option seems totally viable. Uh, <laughs> you're out of your mind, you know? Uh, and, and the movie ended, and they broke up, and, uh, and the Spoiler movie went alert. to black, and a dude in the back of the audience went, no! <laughs> in an angry way. <laughs> As a person who... Uh, makes a full-blown living making movies and has been offered 50 million plus dollar movies all it really is about is expressing the things that are inside of you and sharing them with other people that's really all that matters you've been watching a conversation with Jay Duplass on on story next up filmmaker Raman Seri and a short film Future Hero. Future Hero is a tongue-in-cheek sci-fi comedy. It's a spoof of a few films. I got the idea from having a newborn baby, and the newborn baby is actually in the film, my son Henry, and wanting to uh, see what my baby would look like when he's grown up because we were stuck you know, with, in the diaper stage and it felt like it was taking forever and I thought, gosh, I wish I could just fast forward in time and see what my baby's gonna be like as a grown up. And then I thought, well, what if I see him as a grown up and he meets me and he doesn't like me so much? It was important for me to tell the story because it was, uh, even though it's a silly comedy, it's about fatherhood and family and it's about a father and son working out their issues as they battle a time-traveling killer android. Yeah, this has been Raman Sari. I'm the writer-director of Future Hero, and I hope you guys enjoy the film, and I'm loving it here at the Austin Film Festival. You never want to hang out with us. Oh, that is not true. I'm just sleep-deprived. And I'm not? Yeah, but honey, I work all week, so. Watch your mouth, buddy. So oh, no, 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 I didn't mean it that way. That came out wrong, that totally came out wrong, okay? I know that you work with, the, obviously this is work. I mean, I get that. But listen, I just need like the smallest little scotch of a nap. Oh, you meet me there yes. at the park, nap. huh? And then I'm gonna meet you and the little guy at the park. Huh? You're gonna come here. I am, I am. Don't shoot, don't shoot! Where's the baby? The baby, why? Where is he? Well, uh, he's out! He's out! My wife took him to the park. Get down! Ah! Oh. Yeah! You, 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 oh my god, you killed him! You, you... Relax, he's just an android. A what? He's an android, he's a robot person. He doesn't have a heart. He has a robot heart. It's not important. Are there others? I, 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 I don't know, I don't know, I was asleep.
All right, shut up. Can, can, can I ask who you are? Coast what? is clear. Who are you? I'm your baby. What? I'm your baby grown up. Okay, who are you really? I'm your son, Zach, all right? I've come back from the future through a time portal in your closet to save that guy from killing me. <laughs> what? A drug dealer has sent him back in time to kill me as a baby, to kill me before I grew up. So, to kill the baby pre-growing up, you understand? Killing him in... Is the drug dealer a baby or the... I'm a baby, baby. now! This is me grown up. I'm your son, Zach. I wear a vest. Okay, I don't understand any of that. I don't understand a word of what you're just saying, okay? But I can tell you this. I am totally freaking out right now, okay? So maybe you can just take big guy in the living room. Could you just take the dead body with you and just leave? And I could give you money. I could give you money. God, mom was right. Excuse me? Why aren't you with your family right now, you loser? I was taking a nap! You know what? I don't have time for this anymore. I'm out of here. What? He's gone. I thought you said he was dead. Yeah, well, sometimes they can reboot themselves. They're incredible robots. Very complicated. Huh. Wait, you didn't tell them where I am, did you? Uh, uh... The baby. Did you tell them where baby me is? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I told, I, I told him that my wife took him to the park. Why did you do that? Ah, uh, because he had a gun in my head! All right, where's the park? Oh, there they are. Get there. Get there. What are you oh, doing? God, what, what am I doing? All right, we gotta ambush the android. Okay, we gotta ambush the android. Right, follow right. me. We're gonna go hide over there Following under that tree. Following you to the... No. By the tree. Is this commando crouch really necessary? Wow. She looks so young. She's very old now. Who is that guy? Oh, that's Chuck. She runs away with him. Oh. Wait, what? Yeah, that's right. All right, she gets fed up with you and your, your general lameness, right? She takes me, she runs away with Chuck. Chuck turns out to be a total d He takes, like, all of her money. I don't know like where you are. God, you're probably passed out in a field of losers or whatever you do with your day. Mm -hmm. All right, I end up with a drug dealer on the streets. I have to steal his money to live. All right, then time travel's invented. Now I'm in this mess all because you had to have your stupid nap. Do the cops ever win a What the curse? <laughs> Okay, I got it. Now shoot him! Shoot him, shoot him now! Yes! He's big, he's coming! Shoot him now! Shoot okay. him! <laughs> no, wait, wait! Whoa. Whoa. You're so useless! I know the gun was confusing and I... Now he's going for the baby. He's going for baby me? Oh, not on Big Daddy's watch, he is. <laughs> what the hell? Oh. Oh, heavens. He's down. Ah, uh, baby love, it's okay. He's an android, it's fine. An android? What? Hey, how'd you do that? He's got a power button, and I turned it off. He has a power button? Yeah, yeah, I kind of overlooked that one, didn't you? Wait, now who are you? I'm your son. It's nice to meet you. How are you? Ah, and now, for my little friend Chucky. Get away from my wife. She was coming on to me. Coming okay? on to you. Please, we were just talking, sweetie. Bye, Chucky. Honey, what is going on? It's all right, baby. I'm here now. We're all here. We're all together. And things are going to change. And I'm starting with changing this guy. Oh, let the big cat get his mitts on you, buddy. I'm going to change his day. Whoa. He disappeared. You saved my future, Dad. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Mom. Bye, me. Are you kidding me? Oh, what's that guy? All right. What's happening right now? Baby, 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 believe me, I got this all under control. Hey. Oh.
For more On Story, check out our free podcast at onstory.tv or search the iTunes store. And get the book today, On Story, Screenwriters and Their Craft, on Amazon.